Welcome everybody. This is our July session of the Textile of the Month Club, and today we'll be talking about Kanoko Shibori. Uh, so let's get started with the screen share and the video here. See, first of all, we're going to be discussing just what exactly Kanoko Shibori is. Now, the video series you're about to see are things that I borrowed from, I have taken from a Japanese uh, Shibori site, and I'll give you the link below. Um, it's edited very heavily and remixed for our purposes, but please visit them to see the entire uh, program that they've presented below. Kanoko Shibori, uh, the word Kanoko means deer spot. In other words, uh, the pattern is reminiscent of the little teeny tiny patterns on the back of a fawn. Okay, and that's the um, notion that we're looking at. Lots and lots of little tiny spots. Let's take a look at the first step. The very first thing, of course, is to design your imagery. This artist is drawing it on a rectangular sheet of paper. Quite often what would be done is you would have a kimono mock-up, so sort of a kimono silhouette, uh, pieces of paper done up in a kimono shape, and you would draw over that, draw on the kimono shape to transfer all of your designs, your image, to make sure that the seams to make sure that the imagery flows across the seams. And once you've done that, you'll go along and punch holes into the stencil paper to indicate where those knots will be tied later. And that's exactly what he was doing there, was punching it. And you can see, let me back up just a second here. You can see the traditional types of hole punches. This, this type is the very old variety, as is this one. This variety and this variety and these, you, you may recognize them. They look very much like leather hole punches, and that's why he's hitting it with a mallet, as opposed to this type of hole punch, which is used most commonly in katazome style stencil carving. Once your stencil is carved, you need to transfer it to the silk, to your um, going to be kimono fabric. You do this with a dye called aobana. This is disappearing ink. It's made from the petals of a flower that blooms in early spring. It's completely fugitive. So by taking this large, what's called a peony brush because of its shape, by taking this large deer hair peony brush and transferring this disappearing ink through the stencil, to the fabric, you'll have a drawing and a cartoon basically of everything that's to come. And so a great deal of care needs to be taken in transferring the design. A great deal of care needs to be taken in actually carving the stencil itself. Once it's carved, once the image is transferred to the silk, then you'll tie those knots in. In this particular instance, this craftsperson is doing kanoko shibori by hand. And you can see each little scrap of each little pinch of fabric is done with her fingertips, wrapped with the thread, and then she, she goes on to the next dot. Now, in a case like this, the video tells us that she can knot up to 300 knots per day. Oh, that's what it's saying below here. So in one day, she can do 300 knots. Okay. However, a kimono will take up to 40 thousand knots. So you begin to appreciate how much effort goes into this. And this is a beautiful detail of all those little knotted um, pimples, basically, on the silk tied very closely compact, very tight, so that you get almost a board-like surface from the silk once it's done. On a bolt like this, you can see that there are segments here that are tied as closely as she was tying them just now. There are other areas that look a little bit more floppy or balloony or loose. Those are the sections that haven't been tied. So wherever they've been tied closely, you'll have those tiny circles scattered in their tight grid. And wherever nothing has been tied, that will wind up being dyed in a solid color. And it's that combination of tiny dots and open spaces that create the designs on our finished piece. Again, this will give you a little bit of a close-up. Here, perhaps along this little uh, skyline here, this little ridge, you can see the dots standing up and then the ruffle caused along the selvage from the gathering. Once that brick 
is formed from all these knots, we're going to go ahead and dye it. And of course, the dyers themselves are very skilled craftspeople. Um, he's going to be using synthetic dyes in this case. And look at those wonderful cauldrons. Um, I wish I had some of those in my dye studio. So first of all, of course, he's thoroughly saturating the fabric. Through his expertise and experience, he's able to eyeball the combination of chemicals he needs to get just exactly that precise shade that he's after. And then he'll go ahead and mix that into a slurry with hot water and then pour that through a sieve just to make sure that no undissolved segments go into the pot. Okay, he's, what he's doing here might seem a little bit peculiar. He's testing the temperature, okay, uh, just to make sure it's right at the correct temperature for boiling. Toss in the silk. Now, actually, it's not boiling. It's just below boiling. Boiling would damage the silk. He's going to head and stir it. Now, you need a large pot for this fabric, and you need to be able to swirl it and spin it around in order to open up those little tied areas and make sure the dye gets down in, be in between each crevice. This is a long, uh, it takes a long time, patient work to create this in order to get the very beautiful, even delicate colors that the Kyoto dyers are known for. Okay, and then he'll go ahead with this. If it's a solid color, he'll stop here. If it's a multicolored one, then of course it will go back and segments will need to be blocked off or released, opened or untied, and then dyed once more. But this is what a dyed bolt looks like. Of course, the next step is the untying step. It's not quite as bad as it might seem because they're not unknotting everything. By pulling along the selvage diagonally in both pop the thread that have been tied. Now that does take quite a bit of strength. And of course, there's always a stubborn one from time to time. Once it's entirely unknotted, it's very springy, very shrunk up still, okay, wrinkled in that position. So now you need to open it up to full kimono width in order to sew. And the way that you do that is you run it over a steamer. And notice that the craftsperson here is gently spreading out the fabric little by little, steaming it open as it cools, it stays in that open position. Well, you don't do that all at once. He has to go over this again and again and again in order to steam it open. You can't iron it. If you were to iron it, you would lose all the beautiful texture of the silk. Okay, and so notice the patience required for this. Uh, not work you'd want to do in the middle of a hot, humid summer either. There are little tiny holes you can see that allows the steam to come up. And I'm going to stop here. This is an interesting device. First of all, this copper piece. You have the little well here with the various bolts stored in it. You have the tabletop. This tabletop is the one that is the portion that has all those little tiny holes through which the steam is coming. And you have this sort of inverted cone. The cone is sitting on top of a very large pot and that pot is boiling away. So all of the steam generated by the cone is concentrated in this funnel and then comes out that steam area with quite a bit of pressure in order to soften, relax, open the fabric so that as he advances it towards himself, it cools and stays in position. Um, this is the, used just for kanoko. This is how most kimono fabrics are treated. It's called yunoshi, uh, which means fixing it with steam, okay? And this is the final product. Keeping that bumpy texture which is so characteristic of shibori dyeing is very, very important. Again, you don't want to iron it out ever. So this is the finished finish piece. And you can see this intense um, mass gathering of these little teeny tiny dots that were pinched by hand. And then those few open areas that were blousing out, those received a lot more dye and they helped to create the round solid area that gives contrast to all of those dots. Again, this gives us a little bit of a close-up. I wish I had sharper images of these again, but um, it's great that that site had them available. Okay, so here again, that's a little bit better shot. You can see that this 
dark area in the background is the part that wasn't tied, of course. And then each one of these little squares is where the string had rested. This is a slightly different version that he's doing here. I mentioned sometimes you have to untie and retie. There is another variety of this conical shibori in which you put the part you don't want dyed into a drum. And that's what he's doing here. He has this lacquered drum. And what he's doing right now is with this twisted string, by using this lever to yank back this figure eight, okay, that allows him to go ahead and whack these sticks with his mallet, which holds the twist in place. And of course, the greater the twist, the tighter the drum. And of course, you can't have any possible risk of leakage or, or it would destroy the whole thing. So now that the lid is firmly pinching and sealing off everything inside, and the portion that you want dyed, which is the conical part in this case, is all exposed to the outside, he can bounce and, and play with this drum in the dye pot until it's achieved the color he wants. Going to go ahead and whack off those strings to release the lid and see what a pure white, no leakage whatsoever into the pot. Again, that would have ruined the whole piece. Okay, so now you have a sharp, clean white and you have a very beautiful crisp red on all the sections that define the pattern. And this gives you an idea of what that looks like. E each of these different types of Kanako Shibori have uh, technique names. So as an example, some of them are named after whether you do it with your fingertips. Some of them are, the name is based on whether you're using a needle, as this woman is, a little hook. So she's not pinching it with it. Um, she What she's doing is she's catching it on a needle and using a bobbin-like device to wrap the thread around, pull it down, knot, hook the next dot, pull the thread, next knot, knot, and so forth. You can see how very crucial, both when pinching with your fingers or using a tool, those initial dots, the blue flower dots, the underdrawing that was transferred with the stencil is crucial. And here we are pulling those out again. Okay. And there are other versions yet. Okay, look at this interesting device. She has this hook, okay, to come around, okay, and is catching the thread this way. Notice, though, the finish tied, untied piece doesn't have the individual dots that the wrapping had, but still the overall effect is very similar. Again, each one of these, it gets kind of nitpicky. Uh, if you wrap it one time, it has a certain name for that technique. If you wrap it three times, it has a certain name and so forth. So there are commercially available, meaning for hobbyists, this type of device that you can buy. Um, I did check really quickly online here and it's difficult to find. You can find it through a few Etsy shops. You can also find it through the company that manufactures it in Japan. And I'll put that link below if you're interested in acquiring one. But basically it's the pre-manufactured for you uh, hook to help with your um, catching all those knots. Now, in this case, this person is not going to bother to carve the stencil. What they've done is drawn out their imagery on a piece of paper and they're tracing it onto their fabric with disappearing ink. Okay, and then you see the results there. This is the manufactured item I mentioned a moment ago. It has this little teeny tiny needle picking sticking up there that you can hook on the dot. And she has a little bobbin in her hand. And this is an excellent shot of how it's being tied. Pull down along the rod tightly. Now you can do that as many times as your particular technique calls for. And then you move on to the next knot. Get a little bit of a close-up. Watch how the fabric is folded. It's a little bit origami style. So first it's folded in half one way and then up the other side. And that's what gives you the square shape of some of the knots. And I'll have another shot of that in just a moment. Okay. 
and you see the running line. Again, this brown that you're seeing is that disappearing ink. That all washes out during the dye process. And the finished result, sort of squarish. OK, and one more time here. See how it's folded? OK, into the quarters like that. Hold the thread in place. Pull down along the shaft. And you'll find in a moment um, another example where, see how that, let me stop here. What I'll do is I'll ask you to notice how this thread is being wrapped around the finger to keep it out of being ready to knot, okay? Um, it's a little technique that helps your threads from, uh, it helps you maintain control of your threads. In this particular case, she's done this several times, which takes it into another technique. Again, if it were simply once, it would be fall under one category. Five times falls under another category. And this gives you the result. She's doing a little bit larger one. That's what you saw. And yet one more time here. Again, look at the folding carefully. Whoa. So I just really would like you to appreciate how much goes into this. Uh, in terms of effort. And remember, every single dot. And we're talking about roughly 40,000 dots on an average kimono. A little half hitch, pull, and go on to the next one. Since it's not the square knot, it's this half hitch loop over twice. That's what allows you to pop it off with relative ease later on. Now I'd like to get into, so um, that was the explanation of the technique by the Japanese company, which I'll share in the link below. What I would like to do now is share a couple of things from my own collection. Um, this one is an interesting piece in that it illustrates the fact that many of these tied bolts, not dyed, okay, not sewn, but just the bolt itself has so much value, that's often given as a gift. Now, this was a commemorative piece. And one of the things that's interesting here, okay, it does say it's Kanako Shibori, but it says um, just one dot 10,000 times, <laughs> okay? So it just have to stick to it. Now, the fact of the matter is, um, it's more than 10,000 times, but that, that sounds better. So this, can you see how stiff that appears? It's almost board like now in the samples that were sent out for um, this month, you should see that, um, feel it. In this month's sample, you have the tied piece on the front, but if you open it up on the back, there is a piece of this still tied piece um, that's very stiff. It gives you a point of comparison between the two. Many people think this is machine made, but of course you can't do it by machine. That It would be impossible to get the machinery in for that kind of detail type work. This is the piece after it's been dyed and after it's been untied. And here again, all of the tied spots give you these dots. All of the open area that wasn't tied give you these outline motes of color. And of course, it's still very springy. Of course, you can't wear it like this. So it needs to be steamed open to yardage form so that you can actually make use of it in a garment. This will give you a little bit better detail shot front and back. Okay. And obviously this piece was dyed twice. There's the red in the background and then the, there's the darker burgundy color that went along with it. So I mentioned that this needs to be stretched out in order to be able to, in order to wear it as a kimono. The problem is it's still springy. 
And unless you iron it to get it completely flat, what's going to happen is it's going to sag with time and that causes problems. It looks very, very bad. The higher quality pieces have an additional layer of China silk stitched across the back. You can see the diagonal stitching and the vertical stitching and this very lightly basted back lining stays there. This is what keeps the fabric from sagging once the kimono is sewn up. Still a lot more handwork, of course. And you can imagine again how many knots that is to create that solid piece. Let's compare the width of them. The blue piece is one that is stretched out, ready to go for sewing. The red piece is pretty much as it was once it was untied, still shrunk up. And you can see the white piece is the width as a tied bolt. So you can see how much it's being cinched in on itself. Okay, and of course that would expand out to the full width. Let's take a look at the piece that's in back of me. So I'd like us to take a look at the kimono that's in back of me. It's a Kanako Shibori. First of all, notice how many colors are in it. And so, as you already know from our discussion earlier, each of these need to not only be tied to have the white resisted, but each of the colors need to be individually resisted and dyed as well. So you can see how very much more complicated that will be. And in this case, what I'm showing you, let me start up again. In this case, what I'm showing you is the seam line. So notice how the pattern matches across the seam on both sides. And of course, there's also the seam allowance that needs to be taken into consideration. Again, here again, all of these different seam lines. Very careful workmanship. You can see here, it doesn't quite match, but that quite often happens. Of course, it's not an absolute precise match. The goal is to have the flow of movement of color work as opposed to having absolutely precise uh, matchups. So if we take this and play with it for just a minute, moment, look at some of the different sections, eventually we get to this point here, which is actually an important detail of a kimono. It's right smack dab in front, and this is right side up to us. Okay, so the bottom of the kimono would be at the bottom of our screen. And this line is the kake eri, it's the false collar that goes over the top. Here's the actual collar. This front triangular section is what's called the okumi. It's the extra panel added in front. And this is the side body front. And this little tuck here is just part of uh, traditional kimono stitching. Um, it's a tuck that's taken in the garment so that when a person moves, there's some give. Okay, it is stitched though. This portion is not expected to match. It never does in any kimono. It's covered by the obi, not a problem. Let's look at the actual incredible skill that's required in the sewing, as well as the calculations to make everything match. There are the side seams that match. And then look at right here. We have, there's, this is underneath. So it's part of the equation. There's the kake eri on top that has to match with the body piece. Under that is the, kumi, is the um, uh, okumi that's being matched in, and of course the rest of the body. Now this part doesn't quite match, but that just depends on where the seam is taken. It's still well within the acceptable range. And so you can see the collar is right under that, the false collar on top. Okay, and this, as the collar goes around to the shoulder, the pattern continues to match. In the very back part of the neck, though, that's not expected to match because the neck is higher or lower depending on the cut. But, uh oh, look what we have here. Oh dear, that doesn't match at all. That's not acceptable. It doesn't match. Okay, um, it's pretty bad, actually. All right. And so let's look at that doesn't match. So that means this doesn't match. And it means this doesn't match. And the problem just keeps echoing all the way down the front. Well, as far as flow is concerned, the rest of the body's okay. Um, you can see now the okumi 
that front panel was not part of the calculation problem. It was the collar doing it. Okay, the collar is what was off. The front panels match just fine. Okay, the, the panel plus the side. That's not an issue at all. So those are fine. You can move those up and down to adjust them. But the collar's set in terms of its length. A side panel works just fine. Okay, that's beautifully matched. Okay, and everything else is coming along just fine. Yep, it's just that collar that's the problem. And see, this is where it should actually be. But let's let's backtrack now. Those flowers match, and the back does what it does. It, there simply wasn't enough room in the pattern. The space between the black part and the flowers just wasn't great enough. Okay, and that's what the source of the problem is. Okay, so no matter how it's sewn, that's not going to match. If we match this, it scoots everything over, and now this whole front piece doesn't match. That's the kind of judgment call the seamstress has to make. She only has what she has to sew with. Okay, and then she in turn needs to figure out how to fudge a little. Can I, you know, ooch a little here, stretch a little there? There is some wiggle room. Well, let's stop for a moment. I want to, um, I'm going to leave this image up, but what I would like to do is to read you a letter uh, that was posted on Ichiroya's site way back close to about the year 2000. Many of you are familiar with the site Ichiroya. They had wonderful fabrics up, exquisite textiles. And actually those are the folks from whom I bought this piece. Very early in the startup of their business, they did post an image of this kimono, and this is the note that accompanied it. Now, I did edit it just slightly for clarity, but let me read it to you. It says, today, I'd like to write about my mother, Michiko, on her one-time mistake. As we've mentioned in the past, my mother was a kimono seamstress. When I was a child, she always uh, was always sewing to supplement the family income when she wasn't busy with housework and, and household chores. Now, at that time, there were many needlewomen and the wage was very low. I didn't ask her what the wage was, but I knew it was low because our family wasn't rich. Her technique was at a very high level and some retailers actually gave her credit when selling the kimono sewn by her. Um, it added to her prestige and the prestige of the kimono. Her work was always precise, always careful. However, once and only once, she did make a mistake while sewing a, shi a shibori furisode kimono. A furisode is the long sleeve kimono we're looking at. She misaligned the cutting fabric, and when it was completed, the pattern on the front paddles did not match. It didn't really show when it was being worn, but the retailer demanded that my mother buy back the furisode herself. She had totally screwed up, and they thought that they would never be able to sell it. Well, she was told that the price at that time would be $8,000 retail, but the retailer generously discounted it to $4,000, and she had no choice but to pay for the furisode at that price and just pack it away. And to give you a point of reference, um, keep in mind that we're talking about back in the 1960s, that uh, $8,000 in Japan would have been a very, very substantial amount, okay? This is a higher-end kimono. Um, so it was too large for his sister. It was too large for my sister, and no one could wear it because of its huge size. But my mother honestly thought that she had a valuable hoodie so that even if it had a minor mistake, so when we started our kimono business about two years ago, my mother brought out all her kimono as well as my grandmother's to show us. This is how I came to know about this beautiful shibori uh, furisode and the circumstances surrounding it. Now, at that time, I couldn't assess the value of the furisode. I was only surprised by the story. But now I know the real value of this furisode. It's not something extraordinary, like um, something hand-painted by a famous artist, but it is a gorgeous design. And other than that, it's a very high, but still average level furisode. I was surprised, I was surprised 
even more so by the amount that they charged her for that reason. And the way the retailer treated my mother made me very angry and sad for her. Despite the fact that they always relied upon my mother's skill, why would the retailer demand so much money for a one-time mistake? Why should she have to pay that price? But now Michiko has cataracts and can no longer silk kimono, but she's very pleased to advise kimono as we expand our business. At some point, it is brand new, and it's, of course, well able to offer it at the price that she would be at a very special price, and we'll also share the unique background on our site. Okay, now normally I would not share as much personal information about something, especially an individual talking about the kimonos like this or their, their mother. But this is something they posted on their website for us to share. And I think one of the things we all enjoyed about Ichiroya is how much they became real people to us and part of our lives. And so this has a real human connection. It's one of the reasons I value the kimono. But so uh, I should say that uh, 10, 15 years later, um, their mother developed cancer, and which she was treated for, but she, they decided they need to start selling off some of these things, and they put it back up online. I immediately remembered having read the story 10 or 12 years earlier and got it immediately. I was really glad that I did. It's a very precious part of my collection. So, but it still bothered me when I saw it. I thought, why was she responsible? So let's do a little forensic work here and look at the kimono, okay? Let's examine it and see where that problem came from, okay? And is, is Ichido's mother really responsible for this? So let's take a look. We know it wasn't the sewing, okay? Because we've already examined the back. So basically, uh, Ichido's mother, Mrs. Wada, is out of the picture as far as blame is concerned. But was it the steaming, maybe? Is that where it could have happened? Well. It's already finished by the time you're steaming it. So no, that's not likely to be it. All right. So the next step going backwards is untying. Well, of course, untying has nothing to do with the patterning whatsoever. It's just getting you to the next stage and that's all. All right. Well, next down the line is the dyeing. Dyeing is where it could happen. That's setting the image in the cloth. And so here the dyer is saying, but wait, he's just adding color. He's not setting the pattern. He's not determining where the knots go. So it would be unfair to blame the dyer in that case. Well, then how about the person tying? Because that's setting it. Well, you know, the person who's tying is not doing the design work, actually. They're just spending so much of their life tying knot after knot after knot exactly where they're supposed to. And that's where the dot appears on the fabric from the blue flower. OK, so could it be the blue flower? Well, it could be, it could be that because that's the point at which the image hits the cloth. However, the person applying the blue flower is applying it from stencils. Now, they could have misread the order. They could have miscalculated the space of where to put the stencils, but it's unlikely because of how it's a continuous pattern. You would have had the leaves and the flowers and the dots as one stencil continuing over into this dark black section. That would have been set. So no, it's not the Aobana transfer responsibility. It could have been, but it's unlikely. Well, how about the stencil cutter? Okay, is it the stencil cutter's responsibility? Well, the stencil cutter is the one who cuts the stencil and sets the pattern that the Aobana applier uses. So. It could be that person. Now, the only one left is the one doing the original design. It's unlikely to be the designer because the designer doesn't normally do all of the craft work. The designer normally sketches a fashion plate, maybe will even paint all of the images on a little miniature cartoon. But somewhere, somewhere between taking the cartoon of the designer sketching it out on stencil paper and having it punched. That's where the problem was. 
okay? And that's simply eliminating everything. The unfortunate thing, though, is that Ichiro's mother was the last person to touch it. And she did an excellent job of trying to make do with what she had to work with. But if it's died wrong, it's died wrong. Okay, now what did happen then is I did let um, Ichiroya and Yuka know about this, but problem is, should they tell their mother? Now, I'm not going to tell you what they decided. You decide what you think, okay? But should they tell their mother and let her feel vindicated that she had never done the wrong thing? Or should they let sleeping dogs lie? She's already dealt with it in whatever way. If she was notified it wasn't her problem, then there might be a kind of disappointment or anger or frustration generated, which wouldn't be there otherwise. So is it more important for her to know the truth or is it her peace of mind more important? And I won't tell you how they decided, but that's something for you to decide. Okay. So let me go ahead and stop screen share here. Um, and so that pretty much takes care of what we've dealt with as far as our recording for today. I'll give you a chance to see this entire back part of the kimono just to let you have a little bit higher image grand view of it. I'm going to stop the uh, recording for the general public and we'll go ahead and go into our question and answer. So you can come back on now if you'd like.